Good morning, Denver Community Church. Here we are again online. I wish we were in person this morning, but I'm thrilled that even though we can't gather in person, we are still together to worship, to connect, and to be reminded that we are a church family to learn and to be inspired to go out to love others in the ways of Jesus. I want to remind you that as we move through this crazy time, whether you are comfortable gathering in small groups in person or staying quarantined at home, the DCC has ways for you to connect with others. Social distance and quarantine does not and should not mean social isolation. So visit denverchurch.org to see all that's going on in and through DCC this week. Also, I invite you to give financially this morning. We know some of you may not be able to, but for those that can, I ask for you to consider giving to support DCC as we connect and care for our community and our city. We need you to invest and help make all that we are doing happen. Text Denver Church to 77977 to give now. Thank you for your generosity. As we move into our time of worship, I invite you to be present, to be still, unless you have toddlers hanging on your head, to sing, to learn, and to connect yourself with the divine and the rest of the DCC community. Thanks for joining us this morning.
Oh, great love. Thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and with all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and the weight of glory. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our world. Knowing you hear us better than we are speaking, we offer these prayers in the holy name of God.
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning. At this point in our service, you can go ahead and turn to someone nearby you or send a text offering a loved one grace and peace. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nick Elio. I am our family ministries pastor here at DCC. A longtime listener, first time caller for our online presence here since... uh, COVID-19, but really excited to be teaching and glad that that you are joining us from whenever and wherever that is. Uh, It's a nice luxury to be able to have, to be able to tune in uh, and participate and worship with us. So uh, I do want to say that even pre-coronavirus, DCC has never been about simply creating a place for you to have a Sunday morning experience exclusively. Yes, it's amazing to worship together. Yes, it's amazing to, to sit under the same teaching and to sort of reorient and recovenant ourselves each week. But uh, church is far more than that. And participating in, in a faith community is much bigger than that as well. I remember years ago, I used to hear this Conoco commercial. I think it was on the radio in the car. And uh, they would talk about all the, all the life that happens in your car from road trips to soccer practice to family vacations and all this stuff. And, uh, and then the tagline, you know, they're trying to, to sell you gas, <laughs> I guess. They want you to come and get gas from their stations to then live your life. And the tagline at the end of the commercial was, because life happens between empty and full. And it bothered me so much because what happens between empty and full is I'm standing at your gas pump. That is not when my life is happening. And they weren't trying to advertise how amazing their gas pumps were. It wasn't even the point of this marketing campaign. Uh, And I just thought, how did they miss this? It it should have been life happens between full and empty. I digress about Conoco, but that is so much about what it means to participate in a life of faith. Church is not happening happen from the beginning of our worship experience to the end of our worship experience. Church happens between the end of our worship experience and the beginning of the next one a week later. And so wherever you are at in your involvement with DCC, whether you've been just joining us the last couple of weeks and months during this time of, of quarantine and social distancing, or maybe you've been around for years, know that our hope and goal for you is that you would feel deeply connected and rooted in community, journeying with people, demonstrating God's love, uh, and spending time in the life that is DCC. And so uh, whatever you might need for your next step in that, please take it. Uh, If you're watching online, uh, you can use the comment section right now. You can let us know if there's something that you're looking for, uh, a group, a way to serve. Uh, Our our gatherings are going to be coming back at some point. We're going to need volunteers for all sorts of things. Uh, So please take a step, uh, get involved, participate with us, not just on Sunday mornings, but in between in all that is journeying together and participating in the life of faith. So that said, let me pray and we'll begin our time of teaching. Father, we do thank you that we're able to gather online, uh, that during this time uh, we have uh, the technology. We have the ability to to even do what we're doing at this place in history. And uh, though we're not together, though we're not Uh, maybe doing a lot of the normal things that we're used to. We just pray that uh, as we do gather, uh, as we watch, as we worship uh, through our through our screens, through our computers, through our televisions, that we would remember that we are doing this life together. Uh, this is a community that we are a part of, that we're participating in, and that uh, one day we will be back together uh, again as well. Uh, we pray that this morning uh, that we would just be open to you, and that we would open our hearts and our minds, and uh, that you would just be in all of this today. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. If you have your Bible with you or around you, maybe on an app, you can open Matthew 28. Uh, We're going to be in the last chapter of Matthew and even the last couple of verses. Uh, If you're familiar with Scripture, uh, it's broken up into two sections, the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, About three quarters of the way through, uh, we hit the New Testament, and then the first four books of the New Testament are, are called the Gospels. And these books... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, are about Jesus' life, about his ministry, uh, his subsequent 
trial, death, resurrection. And uh, so we're going to be in the first gospel, Matthew, the last chapter of that gospel, 28, and really uh, just the last four or five verses of that chapter. And so this is all of after, uh, this is all of Jesus's, this, after his life, after his ministry, after his death, and, and even after his resurrection. And this is the last time that the disciples are going to see him uh, in this book, uh, in this uh, gospel of Matthew's. And so we're going to start in verse 16 and read to the end here. Uh, and it says this. Then the 11 disciples, that's minus Judas being the 12th, went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, we know that last words are important. We know that somebody's final words are important, right? Take the idea uh, of somebody on their deathbed, right? The last opportunity for them to say, I love you. Their last opportunity to say, I forgive you, or I'm sorry. Uh, this is an important opportunity that if there's anything that you want to convey, you don't want to miss this opportunity. Or even in the course of our lives, there are times where we want to say something to somebody so that they, they really pay attention and get it. Maybe you remember as a kid growing up and, uh, and having a babysitter and your parents would, would walk the babysitter through the house and tell them all the particulars about how dinner and bedtime worked. And then they'd stop at the door and they'd kneel down and they'd say, look, I want you to be nice to your brother or your sister. Listen to the babysitter and don't stay up too late, right? They're going to leave you with the last few things that they really want you to remember and to hear. Maybe as a parent like yourself uh, or like me now, I find myself doing the exact same thing, telling my boys, be nice to each other. <laughs> I don't want to hear about you hitting, fighting, or arguing. I'm, I'm going to take one last opportunity to, to remind them of what I want them to know. And we see Jesus does this here, right? Jesus' last words are really, really important. And I think he says two things uh, that are worth noting. The first is certainly that he says that I will be with you always. Uh, it's important that he says that. Um, it's nice to know. It's encouraging. It has all sorts of theological implications. But we're going to camp out on, on his last instructions to the disciples, what he tells them to go do, the last thing he says he wants them to do. And what he says is go and make disciples. He says go and make disciples. And admittedly, Jesus could have said anything he wanted to, right? He could have told them any number of things to do. Hey, starting now, I want you to go and start a religion. Name it after me. Lights, fog machines, big buildings, churches with weird, or I should say t-shirts with weird church puns about a breadcrumb and fish instead of Abercrombie and Fitch. Like he could have said, go and do that, but he doesn't. He could have said, uh, hey, go and make sure that everybody just does the right thing all the time and, and you just be the moral authority on everything. But he doesn't say that either. He says, go and make disciples. This is what he wants his legacy to be. This is what he wants his followers to go and do. Which raises really important questions for us then. And we need to ask, what does it mean to be a disciple? And what does it mean to, to make disciples? What is this process of discipleship that Jesus is talking about? And, and how do we fit into it? And as always, when we're reading scripture, when we're, when we're looking at the text, we have to remind ourselves that we, that we need to understand the historical time and place and context. We have to make sure that we're not uh, you know, importing our own worldview, our own time and place and history onto Jesus's words. So when Jesus says this, He's obviously a Jewish rabbi with Jewish disciples in a first century Jewish context. And though discipleship or the process of discipleship is not explicit throughout, uh, throughout the Bible, it does, it does not outline exactly how this should happen in either the Old or the New Testament, uh, it does show up throughout Scripture. Uh, and more than that, we know that from, from a historical standpoint, Jesus was born into a time and place when disciples, when rabbis, when this process of discipleship was an important piece of cultural and religious tradition. See, Jesus grew up in a place called the Galilee. And the Jewish people at the time had a really important relationship with something called Torah. Torah is the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament. And they believed that, that Moses had given, uh, that, that God had given these books to Moses to write down and that this became then the, the foundation of their lives. It, it became the foundation of their educational system. See, most Jewish boys and girls at about the age of six would begin school. And when they did that, they would learn the Torah. 
And so not unlike the way that most of our children begin, you know, sort of preschool or kindergarten at age five or six, uh, was, this was true for, for Jewish little boys and girls as well. And so uh, at age six, they would begin the first level of this education, which was called Beit Sefer. And Beit Sefer well, it went on for about four years from six to 10 and was all about memorizing the first five books of scripture, about memorizing the Torah. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy memorized. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a whole lot of the Bible certainly memorized in large chunks like that. We, time and place, we have, we have apps, we have phones, we have the ability to access that in a way that we don't need to, to have it strictly memorized like that at times. And with that, these are not the most exciting books in the Bible. Uh, these, are, these are some long and, and, dare I say, boring books. I mean, sure, in Genesis, you get the creation narrative, you get, uh, you get the flood, in Exodus, you get the story of the, the Israelites and, and the plagues and the pillar of fire and some amazing things there. But uh, in the rest of these, you get a lot of laws, you get some genealogies. Like, this is some, this is some dry content. So imagine you're six to 10 year old, a self, or, or maybe you have kids, and you're six or 10 year old trying to memorize these books of the Bible. So, Admittedly, at about age 10, most kids would actually move on and, and move into sort of the, the family trade. They would begin to apprentice in some sort of vocation and, and whatever it looked like to participate in their house uh, and, and to make their household run and work. But the best from Beit Sefer would actually move on to the next level of this education. And this next level was called Beit Talmud. And so at age 10, the best from that first class would move on um, and they would begin to memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. That's the rest of the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi. And in order to move on, they would have had to have been seen as, as kids with the most ability, the most potential, the, the, the best knack for this idea of sort of learning and memorizing and participating in this way. And this would go on for another four years in, in Beit Talmud. And, and again, by the end of that, a significant number of, of these kids would then sort of peel off and begin to work the family trade and participate in, in running the household with their family. But now the best of the best would move on to the third and last level of this education system, which was called Beit Midrash. And in Beit Midrash, you would take all that you would learn these first couple of years and these first two processes, and you would actually begin to apply to be a disciple of a rabbi. So you would take all that you'd learned, all that you had memorized, all you would begin to understand about the oral tradition. You would be hoping to get picked up, consider it uh, you know, being drafted, by a, <laughs> whether it be fantasy football or otherwise, by a rabbi. And what you would do is you would go and sit in front of a rabbi and the rabbi would just grill you about your understanding of Torah, your understanding of, uh, of traditions, your understanding of, of all the things that went with this Jewish life of faith. And you wanted this rabbi to think that, that you had it. And, and what did this rabbi need you to have? This rabbi needed you to be able to spread his yoke. Now a yoke is a rabbi's particular understanding or version of this Jewish life of faith, of the traditions, of the scripture, uh, of all that comes with studying Torah. See, at the time, rabbis had differing traditions and understandings of the text. And so each rabbi had a different way of life, a different way that they maybe fasted or prayed or blessed food. And so each rabbi had a yoke. And what rabbis were doing was looking for disciples who could further their yoke, who could carry on the way that they understand what it looks like to live in this way. And so when you applied to a rabbi, when you sat with them, you wanted them to say, come and follow me. Because that would mean that this rabbi thinks that you could know what they know so that you could do what they do so that you could be the way they are and live the way that they do. See, oftentimes a disciple would, would not only observe and then imitate and, and, and do all these things with the rabbi, but they would actually begin to, to represent their rabbi in public. They could, they could represent their rabbi in, in legal proceedings. And, and more than that, the biggest compliment you could get was for somebody to ask you if you were somebody's disciple based on the way that you lived. Remember when, when Peter is asked if he's one of Jesus' followers and he ends up denying him three times? This brings all new commentary and context around that idea because that would have been an amazing thing for any disciple yet at the time, and in the specific context of what's happening, that's not what Peter is looking to hear. 
That was the goal. You wanted people to know that you were a disciple of this rabbi. You were representing this rabbi. Remember when you were in elementary school and you would get the opportunity to go on a, on a field trip to the zoo or a museum and right before you left the school or maybe, maybe it was on the bus right before you went inside, your principal or your teacher would come on the bus and they'd say, hey everybody, listen up. We're about to go into the zoo and I want you to remember, you do not represent yourself in there. You are representing all of Warder Elementary as an attempt to get you to, to behave well and, and listen and, and not do whatever you're going to do. Um, this was the same idea, right? Whatever you did out in public was going to reflect on the rabbi. So when you got this invitation to come and follow me and to participate in this life of discipleship, it was an amazing and huge deal. And so this is the process. This is the process that Jesus used on his disciples. And ultimately, the final step of that process is to go and make disciples. It's cyclical. It has a, it has a repeating process. Now, it's also worth noting that given what we now have, have learned and talked about when it comes to the process of discipleship, Jesus bucks this system in some ways, right? We know that because many of his disciples had jobs, because some of them were fishermen or tax collectors or whatever it was, they were not the best of the best. They had not made, they did not made it through all of these other layers. They had already peeled off to go and, and learn the family trade. So woven into this idea is that, that Jesus chooses underdogs. He says, hey, this isn't, this process, it's not about the specifics of this process necessarily. This is actually what it's about. I want you to follow me and anybody can do it. You don't have to be the best of the best defined by somebody else's standards. This practice and process of discipleship is what Jesus used. And it's what he expected the disciples to use as well. They would have been expected to go and make their own disciples his, his uh, crucifixion notwithstanding, they would have been expected to go and carry on this legacy and begin to have disciples of their own. And so this is what they get invited into and this is what we get invited into as well. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to go and replicate first century Jewish practices. I'm not about to tell you that over the next couple of years, you need to memorize Torah front to back. Um, but what we can learn and, and glean from this process is, is we can try to understand what discipleship is really about and, and what parts of that we need to pick up and carry with us. And we can see that in following Jesus, there's a significant component to that that is about relationship and community. It's about doing life together. It's about having someone to follow. Yes, this whole thing is about following Jesus, but ultimately we need other people to follow as well. We need people who are, who are down the road from us, both in, in life and in faith, um, that we can look to to understand how they're living a life of faith and how they're navigating all that comes with it. These are Paul's words from 1 Corinthians when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? We get this idea that there's this, there's this long tradition, there's this long line of people that have their eyes forward, focused on Jesus with other people in front of them that are all trying to follow Jesus and that in the process of learning from one another, we're better for it. I don't know about you, but there are plenty of times in my life where I need to push pause and say, I need an adult. I need somebody else who knows what's going on, who's been here before, who's, who's been in a relationship or been in a marriage this long, or who has had kids this age, or has been following Jesus during something like this, who can help me? And I know, hopefully you resonate with this, that I've actually needed that way more <laughs> in 2020 than I did previous. I've needed an adult. I need somebody to help me handle. I'm, I'm sorry, I've never lived through a global pandemic before. Uh, I've never been at the age or understanding, navigating all that comes with uh, conversations around uh, racial inequality and police brutality and, uh, and all this stuff. I need an adult. I need people to help me. And I'm committed to the idea of learning from others that are down the road because I think that's part of this idea of discipleship. And in 15 years of ministry, I think we also know that, that this is crucial for all of our faith journeys, that we need people ahead of us leading us. I hear stories all the time and, and have gotten the privilege to hear stories and, and, and participate in, in different ways. And every time I hear from somebody about how they got to where they are when it comes to, to following Jesus, to being involved in church, to, to, to living this life, everybody tells me the name of a person. Everybody tells me a story about somebody that had an amazing impact on their life. Rarely do I hear the story about an event or anyone teaching or some, you know, worship church experience. People 
tell stories about people. Maybe it's a parent. Sometimes it's a coach. Sometimes it's a a teacher or a youth pastor or a small group leader uh, or or maybe some sort of more formal mentor or, or somebody that discipled them. Somebody that said, hey, follow me as I do this, rooted in an understanding of following Jesus, and, and I'm going to walk with you through not just, not just faith, but life and all that comes with it. And I'd be willing to bet right now that even as I'm talking about this, you have the name of, the per, of a person in your mind right now. So where, wherever you're watching right now, let's just flood the comment section with all of these amazing people that have helped us in our journeys. You feel free just to put their first name down if you want to put their first and last name and give them a full shout out. But, but let's just see all of the people that have helped us in our journey throughout the years for, to, for us to get to the place that we are even trying to follow Jesus and, and do this life. And for me, that person, or at least one of the first people to help me do that was, was a youth pastor that I had growing up. His name was Dave Runyon. And that name may be familiar to some of you. Dave has, has worked with a lot of churches and, and people in, in the city for, for a long time now. But for me, Dave was just my youth pastor. And I think there's this other thing that happens, uh, especially referring to youth pastors and, and youth ministry and teenagers, that we don't always think that we need somebody. We don't always think that we need an adult. There's almost like this bell curve that, you know, we certainly need an adult from like obviously zero to, I don't know, five, eight, ten. My oldest is starting to, to think that he knows more than me. Um, and it sort of then, you know, it plateaus around high school, 15, 17, somewhere around that. And you, and you think you do not need an adult at all. <laughs> You've got it covered. Um, and that is certainly, in my, <laughs> that's, that was the season of life that I met Dave uh, for the first time. Um, so I didn't know that, I, that what I needed. But then you sort of come back down the other side as you begin to hit 18, 19, 20. And then further on, you realize the, the benefit and the help that comes with having somebody in that season of your life. And Dave has had an amazing impact on me for, for me really trying to understand what it looked like to follow Jesus for the first time, for me to differentiate from, from the faith of, of the, my original church and parents, uh, from moving from what I would call just being a Christian to being a follower of Jesus, just believing the right things and, and saying that I knew the right things to actually trying to, to live and love a different way. And, and from there... Uh, I had some other people along the way, uh, a guy named Kyle who, who I did ministry with, um, some other people that, that we did youth ministry together in Arvada. And then when I got to, to Denver and to DCC, uh, people on our staff like, like Michael, like John, have, have been able to, to lead me in different ways than, than Dave did at the time. But this also, for me, gave me this incredible starting point for the idea that not only do we get in line to follow a bunch of people who are following Jesus— but the second part of discipleship is that we have to look backwards. We have to begin to consider who's following us. When I was spending that time with, with Dave in my late teenage years, early 20s, it was really the first time that I, that I really got this, this sense of ministry and, and doing youth ministry. And it really started with a basic idea, which was I just need to pay it forward. If I can just be to one other kid what Dave is being to me, then that's, that's a win, right? I didn't have grand aspirations of, of being some sort of, you know, vocational full-time pastor at the time. I just had the sense that I needed to, to pass it on. So in this, this line of people that are following Jesus, I knew that I needed people ahead of me, but then I, I quickly realized that I needed people behind me. Who was I going to lead? Who am I further down the road then? And so, you know, 19 and 20, It was youth ministry. It was middle school and high school students. That was a really tangible and accessible way for me to turn around to somebody and say, hey, I know know where you've been. I know where you're at. I know what it feels like to go through that because I, I just had done that, right? One to five years previous. And now at, in my 30s, I, I'm having a new opportunity to do that same thing. And yes, for me, this, this sort of became a vocation. It became a calling for me to, to put my whole life into ministry. And, and now I get to have this be the foundation of the way Inc. works here at DCC. Our student ministry for middle school and high school students is totally rooted on this foundation of discipleship. Every year we put together a team of 20 men and women that come together for the purpose of saying they want to disciple teenagers. That as they follow Christ, they want to turn around and make sure that they have somebody behind them that is following them. 
even our kids ministry, DCC Kids, over the last couple of years, uh, under Michelle and Maggie, they've done an amazing job creating more opportunities for discipleship, creating more consistency with their leaders, more entry points for kids to know each other and to know the folks that they're spending time with on our sun, in our Sunday morning gatherings. And more and more, we want this idea of discipleship to be so much a part of what happens in our family ministry, zero to 18. And so maybe you're sitting there and you're going, well, I'm not a full-time pastor. I totally get that. I'm also not suggesting that you quit your job uh, and put your application in here. I think that anybody can do this. Again, when I was 19, I wasn't thinking about how this was going to be my job. I just had this sense that I needed to find somebody who was, who was behind me, again, in sort of season of life or you know, season of faith, and, and just try to encourage and help them along the way. So maybe you're sitting here and, and there's a couple other new names that are popping into your head. Maybe it's somebody in your office place. Maybe it's somebody that you've already sort of just picked up from them that, you know, you see yourself in them, right? You look at them and you go, that was me five years ago. That was me 10 years ago when I first got into this gig. And what it means to be a a holistic person of faith is that you're living as a Christ follower, obviously not just when you're here in our building, but when you're at the office. These are not separate You are supposed to be representing Jesus every day. The way you should be living, like the process of discipleship in the first century, people should be walking around going, hey, are you a follower of Jesus? Because I picked up the way that you handled that conflict, the way you talk about people, the way you talk about your marriage and your kids and and your team and all this stuff, that should be evident. So this isn't like some overly religious or, or spiritualized process. This is just to be the way that you are living your life. And you can just come alongside that person and say, let me walk with you. Yeah, both through the things that that come with what it means to be new in this office and new in this vocation, but also life stuff is going to come up in the middle of that. Maybe this is a new framework for how you're going to to teach or coach. Maybe you already spend time with with sort of the next generation, with with teenagers or kids. And there's something about this that, that is sort of, you know, that light bulb is going off for you right now. Maybe it's your own kids. We all know that our first mission field, that the first opportunity for us to disciple the next generation are our own children. And that, that comes in different levels. You know, at, at certain ages, it changes developmentally. But maybe there's an opportunity there for you to think about how this might impact the way that you do that. This idea of discipleship is something that, that plays out the course of our entire lives because we are always going to have the opportunity to have somebody in front of us And we always need the opportunity to have somebody behind us. Earlier, I asked you to put somebody's name in the comment section that it had an amazing impact on you. The harder question is, would anybody have put your name down? And if the answer is no, that's okay. You don't need to feel feel bad about yourself. It's, It's not a guilt trip in any sense. But from here, from today, who might that person be? Because you might have their name in your head or on your heart already. And who's that person? And how might you be able to take a next step towards discipleship so that in six months or a year or five years from now, your name might be who they talk about when it comes to an amazing influence into how they ended up where they are and who they are today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the ways that uh, he led his disciples, that he uh, invited people into his life to show them how a life of faith looks. And we're excited and, and grateful that you did not take the best of the best, that it wasn't about a certain set of criteria that, that they needed to meet or that, or that we have to meet. And God, today we just... We create space in our lives to participate in discipleship. And maybe that means we're going to look ahead to somebody that we need to follow because we're missing that. Or more than that, maybe it means we need to look behind us and figure out what it means to have somebody following us. And and whatever that means, Lord, I pray that we would take that next step, that you'd give us the courage, you'd give us the, the wisdom and the discernment to navigate that, and that we would more and more represent you in our city, in this world. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
Please join us as we pray our prayer of confession and assurance. Almighty and most merciful God, we confess that we have fallen short in love, in word, in thought, and in deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. God, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image to the glory of your name. Amen. Remember that you are loved, you are forgiven, and you belong. Let us be known by our
As we begin to take communion, please take a second and gather your elements. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup, and he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. God, we thank you for the gift of communion, for the gift of your love, and we lift our hearts up now to you and receive. Now I invite you to take your bread and remember that this is Christ's body broken for you. And as you dip the bread into the wine and juice, remember that this is Christ's blood poured out for you. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. As you go, I invite you to do so in a posture of grace and love towards all you encounter and go with this blessing. My brothers and sisters, may you engage and embrace the divine each day. May you be compelled to love others as yourself and may you take care of yourself so you can serve others. May you experience connection and intimacy with Christ as you do. Peace be with you.